All right, so let's see how you did. So these are hand-drawn graphs. You'll have one like this tomorrow on your quiz. It says to analyze what's happening to the y values as x approaches 1 from both sides. So let's go ahead and write out the notation first. So here's what I'll expect you to write tomorrow. The limit, right, LIM, uh, and you can write it in cursive, you can write it non-incursive, print, whatever. As long as I see LIM, that's good. And then underneath the limit, you put X arrow, and then our input is 1, so we're approaching 1. And then from the left, you put the negative sign. And then you put the function up here on the same level as the limit. Okay, so the limit and F of X are on the same level. And then the input is written down below. And then we put equals. So get, get used to writing that. Now we go ahead and jump on the graph to the left of 1. And we start heading back towards 1, and we are obviously approaching the y value of the open circle, or the closed dot, sorry, which is at what? Negative 3. Okay, so pretty easy there. And now on the other side, we'll write the limit as x approaches same value of x, 1, but this time from the right-hand side. And then we're on the graph of f of x again. So now you don't have to go way to the right of 1, just, just to the right of 1. Start heading back towards 1. We're getting closer and closer to... Now the open circle, whose y value is at what? Negative 5. So that right there is where the limit kind of earns its keep again because we can't talk about f of 1 being negative 5 because it's an open circle. But we can certainly say the limit value from the right is negative 5. All right, now the last thing we're going to do here is what is f of 1? Negative 3. Okay, so that's where we're looking at the dot. So if you notice in this case, the limit from the left is the same as the function value. So if you're going to do that construction analogy with Road Bridge Road, maybe the company that built the road coming in from the left also built the bridge, and so they knew where to build it. But the company that was hired to build the road coming in from the right never communicated with the other company. They just built the road to uh, literally nowhere, which is negative 5. So in this case, both the one-sided limits exist, but they're not the same. And when that happens, what type of discontinuity do we have? A jump, okay? So we're working towards defining all of these discontinuities by way of limits. So any time the limit from the left and the limit from the right exist but are different numbers, you're going to have a jump. So F has a jump, and we'll just say at X equals 1. And it doesn't matter what the function value is doing because this is a non-removable discontinuity. The function value can plug the uh, hole up here, the hole down here. It could be in between them, below them, above them, or not even exist. It doesn't matter. Remember, the limits do not care about the function values, and the function values do not care about the limits, right? The limits of the roads, the function value is the bridge. All right, so now there's one other thing we're going to talk about here. It's called the general limit, the general limit. And it's denoted in general like this. It's the limit as x goes to some x value, call it c, of f of x. So what do you notice about that limit aside from the c value, which can take on any value, compared to the other limits we've been doing? What is it lacking? The plus or minus, right? There's no, like, ionic charge-looking thing. There's no exponent-looking thing. So whenever you see no plus or minus right there, that means it's the general limit, okay? And that general limit is only going to exist if the limit from the left and right sides exists and are equal, okay? And are equal. So here's the theorem, the, the definition, essentially. It's an if and only if. So we'll start on this side. If the limit as x goes to c is equal to some value L, where L is a Y value. Of course, the limit is a Y value. So if we know that, then we know the limit from the left and the right are also going to equal that same Y value. But it works the other way around, too. If I know the limit from the left and the right are the same Y value, then I can say the general limit exists and is the exact same Y value. Okay? So for the general limit to exist, the roads have to be lining up. That's it, right? The roads have to be lining up to the same y value. Let's come back up here to example one and talk about the general limit at three. The limit as x goes to three, no plus or minus now, that's the general limit. What can we say about that, if anything? Does it exist? And if so, what value is it? It's five. Very good. Based on the theorem, the limit from the left was five. The limit from the right was five. Five equals five, so the general limit is five. Now, by the same token, if I had given this to you to begin with, you would have been like, ah, no plus or minus. That means that we're approaching five from both sides. Now, incidentally, if that was the only piece of information I gave you, just that, forget that we even know what the graph looks like. If that's the only information I gave you, 
Could you use that to determine if the function was continuous at 3? Yeah. You could? Right. The limit tells us only about the what? Very good. The limits only tell us about the roads. In order to know if it's continuous, we have to know something about the function value. We have to know something about the bridge. Is it there or is it not? So we need to know something about whether it's open or closed. This only tells us that the roads are lining up. It's only when you look at the function value and compare it to the limit, it is also 5, so that basically connects the two roads, and now we know it's continuous. So to be continuous, the limit from the left has to equal the function value and has to equal the limit from the right. Okay? Very good. What can we say down here on example 2 about the general limit as x goes to negative 4? Does it exist? Does it not exist? If so, what is it? It exists, right? The limit from the left was 2. The limit from the right was 2. 2 equals 2, so the general limit is 2. If the roads line up, the general limit exists. So again, if I only gave that to you, you would only know that the road from the left and the right were approaching 2. You wouldn't know if it's continuous or not until you looked at the function value. And in this case, the function value was not 2. So we had what type of discontinuity? Is that a jump? Yeah, be very careful. If we're graphing it from left to right, I'll admit that to get from here, you have to jump up here to plot that and then jump back down. But that's using jump as a verb, not as a term. This is not a jump. This is a removable point discontinuity, remember? It's a hole, okay? It's a hole. So that's one of the, we're going to define the hole now in terms of limit. We're right here. We might as well do it. When the limit from the left equals the limit from the right, your roads are pointing at the same place. If the function value doesn't exist or it exists but it's a different y value, you're always going to have a hole every single time. If the limit exists, if the general limit exists, but the function value either does not exist or exists and is a different value, you're going to have a hole every time. Okay, And there's only really two times where the general limit's going to exist. The general limit is only going to exist either if the function's continuous there, the roads are connected by a solid dot, or the general limit's going to exist in this case where there's a hole and it's connected by an open circle. That's it. That's the only time the general limit will exist. So coming down here, what can be said, if anything, about the general limit as x goes to 1 of this function? Well, the limit from the left was negative 5. The limit from the right was, I'm sorry, the limit from the left was negative 3. The limit from the right was negative 5. Does negative 3 equal negative 5? No. So the general limit doesn't exist. And you know what we write if it doesn't exist? We use the capital letters D and E, which stands for does not exist. And it's a customary abbreviation in a math class. Anybody who knows anything about math knows what you mean. You do not even have to put dots, okay? It's an acronym, but you don't even have to put dots. Just put DNE. It doesn't exist. Now, you're going to find that general limits can fail to exist for a multitude of reasons, okay? In this case, the general limit doesn't exist because the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right. And any time that happens, we're going to have a what discontinuity? A jump, okay? So we're starting to define not only continuity in terms of limits, but discontinuities in terms of their limit behavior. All right, so um, there's one other discontinuity that we haven't talked about, right? Which one? Vertical asymptotes, okay? They're coming. They're coming. Right now, let's go ahead and officially define the two discontinuities we've been talking about, holes and jumps, by way of limits, okay? So here it is, example 4A. When the two one-sided limits exist and are the same, that is, the general limit exists, and the function has either not been defined or is defined but is somewhere else, we're always going to have a hole there every single time. When the roads line up and the general limit exists, you're always going to have a hole as the function value doesn't exist or is something else. So with this graph right here, go ahead and answer this first row right here. Limit from the left is zero, limit from the right is zero, and the general limit at zero. Using that graph, this is going to be, again, like what your quiz would look like. This is the easy way to find limits. You're just eyeballing it. It's 
this little x bunny thing. That means from the left, from the negative side. Right, x is left and right. So negative means left. So you hop on the graph somewhere to the left of zero. Hop on right here. Mm -hmm. Start heading back towards zero. What are you approaching? One. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the negative sign means from the left. You're not moving left to get there. You're approaching from the left. That's a big difference. Because if you're moving left to get there, you're actually approaching from the right. So we read that as from the left, from the right. All right, most of y'all are done. The limit as x goes to 0 from the left. Okay, so here's x equals 0. It's also not on the y-axis. When you hop on the graph to the left of 0, don't hop on way over here. That's way too far away. We want to know what's going on in the neighborhood of 0. So hop on the graph just to the left, like right about here, and start heading back towards it. What are we getting closer to? 1. So that's this value. From the right of 0, again, don't go too far. Just hop on just to the right. Start heading back towards it. What are we approaching? Also 1. Okay? So based upon that, what can be said about the general limit? It's also 1. Okay? Now remember, that just means that we're approaching 1 from both sides. That's all that means. It doesn't mean it's continuous. If we approach from the left and right and it's the same value, we say that's 1. Now, for kicks and giggles, what is f of 0? Yeah, now you look at 0 and you notice there's a dot right there. It happens to be 1. So if you compared that y value at 0 to the left and right sided limit, which are the roads coming in, they're all connected at the same y value, correct? So that's when it's continuous, when the limit from the left equals the function value, which equals the limit from the right. We have a road coming in, connected to a bridge, connected to a road going out, and the function's continuous. And you can clearly see that on the graph. All right, do the bottom row. Let's approach three now. You're just driving on the road. That's all you're doing. Hop on the graph to the left and start approaching 3. Hop on the graph to the right start approaching 3. See what the y values are doing. There you go. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. All right, so you got to find 3. 3 is right here. If you hop on to the left, we'll hop on right here. Start heading towards 3. We're getting closer and closer to the open circle, whose y value is at what? 0. So that's the limit from the left. Hop on the graph to the right, start heading back towards 3. We're getting closer and closer to 0 again, okay? So what can we say about the general limit? It's also 0. The general limit is 0. And again, remember, this tells us nothing about continuity. It only tells us the roads are in place. It possibly could be continuous. The roads are pointing at each other. To determine continuity, we need to determine what the function value is. So what is f of 3? Yeah, now you go to 3, and you look up and down, and I see a dot down here at negative 1. Is negative 1 equal to 0? No. So someone built a bridge, maybe in a horrible attempt to try and connect the roads, and they did a really bad job of it. It's down here. So this is obviously not continuous. So what type of discontinuity do we have when the general limit exists, but the function value either doesn't exist or exists somewhere else? It's a hole, right? And you can clearly see that right there. It's a removable point discontinuity. All we have to do to make it continuous again is fire the bridge contractor and hire a bridge moving contractor to move the bridge right here. And now it's continuous. Okay? What's that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah. There's business always for people to clean up other people's mistakes. Right? There's always business for that. All right, so that's a hole. So the general limit now only exists in two cases. When the function is continuous there and the roads are connected by a solid dot, or when there's a hole and the roads are connected by an open circle. Those are the only two cases where the general limit exists. Okay, so now let's look at the next one that we've been talking about, the non-removable jump. Go ahead and look at the same function, but now evaluate it at negative 2. Cruise on the graph. Mm -hmm. 
negative T and are approaching from the left. So hop on the graph to the left and start heading towards it. Yeah. Again, the negative sign means from the left. So here is negative 2. You hop on the graph to the left and start heading back towards x equals negative 2. Yeah, that would be from the right. Nice flower. All right, let's see how you did. Negative 2 is right here. This, again, doesn't mean go left to get there. It means from the left. So you actually hop on the graph to the left somewhere, like right here, and you start heading back towards x equals negative 2. The graph is taking you up to what y value? Positive 2. And then approach 2 from the right. Hop on the graph somewhere to the right. Start heading back towards negative 2. The graph is taking you towards what y value? Negative 1. Again, the limit doesn't care if it's a solid dot or an open circle. We're talking about roads here. What can we say about the general limit then? It does not exist. Good. So that is the definition of a jump discontinuity. When your limit from the left exists and the limit from the right exists, but they are two different values, your roads are not lining up, there's going to be a jump every single time. And it doesn't matter what the function value is because it's a non-removable discontinuity. Maybe so, right? Travis Pastrata style. Um, what, would, what would f of negative 2 be? Just because just we're curious, what would f of negative 2 be? 2, right? So you look up at here and you see the dots. But it doesn't matter. We could hire a bridge moving company to move that bridge somewhere else. It's not going to make it continuous, right? Well, we don't want to take the road with it. There we go. Yeah, we can put it here. We can put it here. If we put it in the middle, maybe we build some ramps. And we can maybe span the gap. I don't know. But it's not removable. So it doesn't matter what the function value is doing. When the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right, the roads are not lining up, you have a jump each and every time. All right, let's go ahead and meet the last discontinuity and define it in terms of a limit. So shifting gears here. We've done holes, we've done jumps. Here are your vertical asymptotes. If any one of the following four things happen, any one of the following four things happen, if we approach an X value, this is an arbitrary X value, could be five, could be negative 10, if we approach that x value from the left and the limit is infinity, whoa, wait, what does that mean? Is the limit an x value or a y value? The limit is a y value, right? So when we say that the y value is infinity, that means the y values are doing what? Going up, down, left, or right? Up. They're going up for how long? Forever. Forever. Good. If you approach an x value from the left and your y values are increasing without bound, that's what we say, they are increasing without bound, or you approach from the left side and you're approaching negative infinity, that would be going down forever, that would be decreasing without bound, and or it could also happen on the other side. If you approach an x value from the right side and you have one of the same two things happening, the y values either go up or down forever. Some functions only live on one side of their vertical asymptote. Let's look at that. Here's the vertical asymptote. We're used to drawing them. Some functions only live on one side. So like right here, if this were x equals c, what would be the limit as x approaches c from the right-hand side of this function? It'd be negative infinity, right? So log functions. We're going to study log functions later on. They only live on one side of their vertical asymptote. That would be enough then to say, ah, there's a vertical asymptote at x equals c because there's something there that's forcing the y values down forever and ever and ever at an x value, okay? But there are a lot of functions that live on both sides of their vertical asymptote. So in this case, what would the limit as x goes to c from the left of the function be? It'd be positive infinity, okay? Now let's talk about when I say the limit is infinity. If the limit is infinity, do you think the limit actually exists? No. If I say that you all have infinite potential, I'm basically saying there is no limit to all the great things you could do, right? And that's a true statement, by the way. So there's your motivational speech for the day. So when you say that the limit is infinity, you're actually saying two things. You're saying, first of all, that the limit doesn't exist. But then you're saying why? Because the y values are going 
up forever, okay? Same thing if you say that the limit is negative infinity. If I said y'all had infinite negative potential, that would not be a very good motivational speech. There is no limit to how bad y'all could be, Ugh, right? When you say that, you're saying, again, the limit doesn't exist, but you're, then you're saying why? Because the Y values decrease without bounds. So D and E is a technically correct answer, but I don't want y'all to put that at a vertical asymptote when we're talking about one-sided limits because it's not giving enough information. Remember, I said already that limits can fail to exist for several reasons, okay? So that's it. One of those two things can happen. Let's try it out. Example five, let's do A together and y'all do the rest. What would be the limit on the graph at the right as we approach negative one from the what side? Left, okay? So come to the graph. Here's negative one right here, up on the graph to the left and start going towards negative one. Where are we going? We're going to infinity, okay? So infinity is the answer I want you to give. Technically, it's D and E, but we also know why, because it's going up forever. All right, go ahead and finish out uh, B through H. B through H. If you need the graph, here it is. Everybody has the iPad. That's good. You have to look at both sides. So remember, we can only say something about the general limit if it's the same on both sides. That's the only time it exists. Yeah, there's a couple in here that I'm leaving for your own interpretation. Let's look at this one. From the right-hand side of negative 1, that should be pretty easy. Here's the right side. We start heading back towards the negative 1. It appears we're also going up to infinity, right? Which, again, remembers we're saying that the limit doesn't exist because it's increasing without bounds. What do you think then we can say about the general limit at negative one? Very good. We can actually say infinity here. D and E is technically correct again, but because it's going up on both sides, we can actually say positive infinity. So if you walked up and you saw this, a general limit equals infinity, you then can infer it's going up on both sides of negative 1, all right? That's the only time you can say that. If it's going down on both sides, you can say negative infinity. All right, what is f of negative 1? Look up, look down at negative 1. Do you see an ordered pair? Do you see a dot? I don't either. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have one there because we can make one with a piecewise definition. All things are possible. But it would look like that, and we don't see one, so... This would be uh, non-existent or DNE. It's undefined. You can put DNE. What about the limit from the left of positive 2? Negative infinity? Yep, very good. It doesn't exist because it decreases without bound. From the right of positive 2? Positive infinity. It's going up. And then what do you think we could say about the general limit? Excellent. Y'all are catching on fast. DNE. You cannot give two answers, so you cannot say plus or minus infinity. It has to be one answer, and because it's not doing the same thing on both sides, you got to put D and E, okay, non-existent. Uh, and then finally, F of 2. You see any dot at 2 up and down? No dot, right? So D and E as well. All right, cool. So these are called infinite non-removable discontinuities. You can clearly see now why we call them infinite discontinuities. They force the y values up or down 
to a certain type of infinity? Maybe, or we still have example 5B. Ooh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So everything we've done so far, we've had a graph. Yes. Yes. Everything we've done so far, we've had the graph. And if you have the graph, it's really easy because all you have to do is look. look. All right? But we're not always going to have the graph. Case in point, example 5B. We have the function f of x equals negative 4 over x plus 2. I want to analyze the limits on either side of the vertical asymptote. So we're going to do it two ways. First of all, we're going to do it by sketching the graph because I'm going to review parent functions and transformations with you. Okay? So here we go. This should be review. If not, learn it because I'm teaching it to you. The parent function for this guy here is the reciprocal function. It's 1 over x. Now, maybe you have experience with 1 over x, maybe not. Here's the graph. You need to memorize it. It has an x and y axis. And as you well know, there's a vertical asymptote at what? x equals 0, because that's not in the domain, and it gives you non-zero over 0 when you plug it in. But there's also an end behavior asymptote known as a horizontal asymptote. We'll talk about those tomorrow. It looks like that. So this is called the reciprocal function. The reciprocal of a very small positive number is a very big positive number, and the reciprocal of a very big positive number is a very small positive number. So it looks something like this. It comes from infinity, and then it kind of curves away from it and approaches the other asymptote. And then it does the exact same thing in, in quadrant three. The reciprocal of a negative number is a negative number. So it comes from the vertical asymptote, and then it tapers off towards the horizontal asymptote, or vice versa. It comes from the horizontal to the vertical. This is actually a hyperbola. It's a rotated hyperbola if you studied these in a, algebra two, maybe. If not, that's okay, right? This is what the graph of one over x looks like. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put this guy into standard transformation form and see if we can't sketch what he looks like. So to do that, the 4 on the top comes out front with the negative 4. We can pull that out front because it's really just negative 4 over 1. Okay? So now in standard transformation form, if you remember, this is your A value, and this is inside with the X, so that's your C value. So let's go ahead and sketch what this guy looks like. We're going to take the purple graph that I drew on the left, and we're going to sketch the new graph. All right, review. Anytime you have a negative in front of a function, what does it do to the graph of that function? Flips it across the x-axis. It's an x-axis reflection. So that would take this 1 over x, and I'm going to draw it as a dotted line. It's going to reflect that piece into quadrant 4, and the piece that's in quadrant 2 now reflects up to quadrant 2. 3 goes to 2. So now we have that dotted line graph. Um, what would multiplying in the front by 4 do to any graph? Stretch it vertically by a factor of 4. We're not going to show that. That just makes the graph a little steeper, okay? We don't typically show those. So now the last thing is the x plus 2. It's a c value. It's inside with the x. It's added, so it's a horizontal shift. Is it left or right to? It's left to. Remember, it's the opposite of what it appears. Now, you can verify that with your knowledge of domains, right? Duh. What value is not in the domain here? x cannot equal what? Negative 2. That's where the vertical asymptote is. It went from 0 to the left to negative 2. So we'll go ahead and draw that at negative 2, and we'll draw our new vertical asymptote. There's the new horizontal asymptote. And remember, it lives down here now, and it lives up here. So there is a quick review of basic transformations of what is now a parent function, the reciprocal function 1 over x. Add it to your mental catalog. So we really have... Uh, right now, we just have x, x squared, and now 1 over x. All right, so now that you have the graph, it's real easy to answer these questions, right? Let's do them together. Negative 2 from the left. Negative 2 from the left is going where? It's going up to infinity, absolutely. Negative 2 from the right-hand side is doing what? Negative infinity. Cool. I'm going to put equals negative infinity. You can either do that, equals negative infinity, or I'm going to write it underneath there. Remember, when you evaluate an expression, you can put it underneath. That looks better. You don't need equal signs. What then can be said about the general limit at negative 2? D and E. Good. It's doing one of each, so we cannot say plus or minus infinity. And the function value at negative 2? 
it's D and E. When you plug in, you get a zero in the denominator. And remember, that means it's not in the domain. So function values, they can't live on sometimes like limit values can. If you get a zero in the denominator, the function doesn't exist, it's game over. The limit could still exist, the function value, no. The negative right here in front okay. reflected it across the x-axis. Your old, your old standard uh, for reference is x squared and negative x squared, right? x squared opens up, negative x squared opens down. So it reflects across the x-axis, yeah. And then the 4 was a vertical stretch. We didn't show that. Now, this is a typo. <laughs> is the function continuous at x equals negative 2? That's what it should be. No. Remember, to be continuous, we need three things. We need a road, a bridge, and a road. And they all need to be connected. Well, we have none of those, actually. The limit from the left doesn't exist. There is a road that looks like it's trying to come in to negative 2, but then it gets scared and turns up and runs alongside the vertical asymptote forever. So we don't have a road coming in. We certainly don't have a bridge. There's no function value. And we don't have a road coming out the other side. It's running parallel to it the whole time, essentially. So we don't have any of the three things we need. So this is no, no. And the easiest way is just to say f of negative 2 equals d and e. If any one of those three things that we need to cross, a road, a bridge, a road connected, if any one of them fails to exist, it's game over for crossing. It's game over for continuity. The function value doesn't exist, okay? Now, one last thing. I'm gonna, we're going to finish up here. One last thing. What if we didn't know what the graph looks like? No, oh, I erased them. I don't know what it looks like. Oh, so like if this were on a quiz tomorrow, I wouldn't expect you to graph it. Nope, I wouldn't. Here's what I would expect you to do. Use the information that we've already been studying this year. Already, right? What would be the domain of F? It would be the set of all X such that what? X cannot equal negative 2. If you need to set the denominator equal to 0, that's fine. Is that a whole or a VA at negative 2? Nope. Yeah, remember you could tell by plugging in. When you plug in, you get negative 4 over 0. Non-zero over 0, remember, means what? DA. So you know automatically that there's a vertical asymptote on this graph, whatever it looks like, at x equals negative 2. You know that. You absolutely know that, which means this. If I'm asking you for the limit from the left and right of negative 2, where you know there's a vertical asymptote, you know the answer is going to be one of two things, namely what or what? Infinity or negative infinity. Absolutely. I'm going to come back and get the signs separately. I know it's going to be some type of infinity because I know there's a vertical asymptote there. Yeah, sure. Here's how we find the sign. You might want to wait for this if you can because this might be on the quiz. Real quickly, here's how we find the sign. If you are approaching from the left of negative 2, if you pick a value on the number line that's just to the left of negative 2, like by a tenth of a unit, these asymptotes are like gravity. You're going to be pulled so close to that asymptote when you're that close to it, you're already going to be well on your way towards the infinity you're going to be heading towards. So what is a number that is a tenth to the left of negative 2? Negative 2 and 1 tenth, right? Negative 2.1. So since we're approaching from the left, Pick a number to the left, like negative 2.1. Come back over here and plug it in. That's negative 4 over, plug it in for x. Negative 2.1 plus 2. All we need to look for is the S-I-G-N sign. The top is negative, and what's the bottom sign? Negative 2.1 plus 2 is what? It's negative. What is a negative divided by a negative? Positive. There you go. That's the sign of your infinity. You know it's some type of infinity, Plug in a number just to the left and figure out the sign. And we'll do the same thing here. If I'm approaching negative 2 from the right-hand side, what's the number that's just to the right of negative 2? Negative 1.9. Good. Let's do that. We'll plug in a negative 1.9 right here. I'll get rid of the negative 2.1. If I plug in negative 1.9, of course, the top is going to be negative, right, because it's a negative 4. What's 2 minus 1.9? It's a positive number, isn't it? Because 2 is bigger than 1.9. What is a negative divided by a positive? A negative. There you go. That's the sign of your infinity. Negative. Those are the same answers we got when we had the graph. You don't need the graph. You're going to use your knowledge of the vertical asymptote 
and then find the sign by just picking a number that is a smidgen to the left and a smidgen to the right. All you're doing is determining the sign of that infinity. Okay? We will stop right there. We will quiz them tomorrow through anything we've talked about, including the warm-up and any of the discontinuities we've had today. I'm not going to make you graph something. From the warm-up from yesterday, too? Yeah, anything from this section. Anything from two?